Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Non-Fiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation. Welcome to Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction's official podcast. I'm Razia Iqbal, journalist, broadcaster and your host for today. On March the 9th, the shortlist for the Winner of Winners Award, which will go to the best of the previous 24 winners of the Bailey Gifford Prize, was announced. The shortlist was chosen by a panel of judges chaired by Jason Cowley and featuring Sarah Churchwell, Shahida Bari and Francis Wilson. The judges chose the following. Craig Brown's 1234, The Beatles in Time, Wade Davis's Into the Silence, The Great War, Mallory and the Conquest of Everest, Barbara Demick's Nothing to Envy, Real Lives in North Korea, Patrick Radden Keefe's Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty, Margaret Macmillan's Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, formerly Peacemakers, Six Months That Changed the World. And James Shapiro's 1599, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare. That is the shortlist. Over the next few weeks, I have the um, enviable pleasure of talking to each of the shortlisted authors about what has inspired them, what it's like to be in contention for the Winner of Winners Prize. And our first author is Barbara Demick, who won the prize back in 2010 for her book, Nothing to Envy, Real Lives in North Korea which gave us a glimpse behind the curtain of what is possibly one of the most secretive countries in the world. Welcome, Barbara. Thanks so much, Razia. Fun to be here. Let's start with the beginning. I mean, you have had been the um, LA Times first bureau chief in South Korea. Talk us through the germ for the idea of this book. Well, I think um, Nothing to Envy was... um sort of a, a work of obsession because, you know, as you said, I was the bureau chief in, in Seoul, South Korea, and the first one for the LA Times. And my my territory, my beat, so to speak, was all of the Korean peninsula, including North Korea. And at that time, the time I started, uh, it was virtually impossible for a US citizen to get permission to visit North Korea. And I, I, I've said this before, but you know, j- journalists are um, very contrarian creatures. And if you tell, tell us that we can't go someplace, you know, we, we <laughs> really want to go and we really get interested and we really get obsessed. And it was a very frustrating experience for me. Some of my friends with um, Canadian and British and uh, Australian citizenship were able to to go on these guided tours, but I wasn't. And I used to dream about North Korea. I mean, I literally not fantasize, but I'd have dreams of um, of you know being in North Korea. So I started to recreate um, my experience or my my yearnings by interviewing every North Korean I could find. Just you know, really, I, I keep on saying obsessively, but it was obsessive because I wanted to, you know, create for myself the experience of walking those streets and smelling the smells and being there, really being there. So there was a lot of, you know, very close, granular reporting that re- went into recreating the lives of these North Korean people. A, a lot of books on North Korea are based on interviews with defectors, but there is this thing about defectors. They have a kind of incentive or a kind of impulse to exaggerate. And the, what you decided to do kind of prevented that from being something that readers had to take into account. Just explain who you chose to to focus and and why why the kind of corroboration idea in your book is so important yes exactly i i i picked um you know very ordinary people in fact the subtitle in the american edition is um ordinary lives in north korea you know i didn't want somebody who was you know marginally famous you know spinning a tale of um some horrific prison camp or work on a nuclear project. These were very ordinary people. And I picked them all from the same city, Shenzhen, because that 
did allow me to corroborate. And I really used, you know, kind of a um, the standard you would in a courtroom of witnesses and corroborating witnesses. Um, you know, so so if if you know if one person talked about seeing bodies of dead children behind the train station in 1995, and then three other people um, independently saw that, you know, you knew it was true. And it gave me, um, as the writer, and hopefully the reader too, the feeling of, yes, we are there, we are seeing it ourselves. And, you know, th there's something when you do human rights reporting of, um, you know, you hear these horrific things, these horrific stories. And it's not that you disbelieve them. You don't necessarily think people are lying, but you don't believe them. You don't feel like you've witnessed them yourself. And that that was the hurdle I wanted to overcome. I, I, I want to talk about the, the, the characters in your book, these ordinary people that you chose to, to focus on from interviews with many, many people, but you decide to alight on, on, on six in, in just a moment. But let's deal with the title first, because it does, it does allow us a way into the, the mindset of the ordinary lives that you are trying to portray. Yes, Nothing to Envy comes from a North Korean song. It's a very popular children's song, and uh, I'll spare you the singing. But, um, <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you dig into your archives, you could find me, me singing it in Korean with one of the, one of the people in the book I many years wonderful. ago. But um, <laughs> it, it, was not, it was not wonderful. <laughs> but... Uh, the song is, you know, we have nothing to envy in the world, blah, 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 because we live in the greatest place and, you know, under the loving care of our leader, Kim Il-sung. And then that song was updated after Kim Il-sung died in 1994 to Kim Jong-il and now Kim Jong-un. Um, and it's a very popular song, though. The words, we have nothing to envy are on the... Um, arches over many kindergartens. It was on um, some of the currency for a while. And you know, North Koreans were taught that, you know, the rest of the world was a mess. You know, Americans were, you know, starving in the streets. Um, South Koreans, you know, were the puppets of the Americans, but their place, their their country was the, the best. And in the course of the book, because the the people in this book, you know, evolve considerably, um, they come to realize that this slogan was a lie. And as one of the women says, you know, our whole life was a lie, everything we were ever told. And so the Nothing to Envy um, became the title. And, you know, it, it obviously has, you know, another meaning is that we shouldn't envy them. Of course. Uh, the The... You write exceptionally beautifully. There is a kind of novelistic um, element to the stories that you tell of these people's lives, and and it's quite clear that you want to you want to humanize them because for the the West it's so easy to demonize North Korea as we learn that the North Koreans are taught to demonize the, the the West. Let's start right at the beginning though, because I think that how you begin the book it, it really provides for us a, a metaphor for, for what the book then it is. And and you begin with a with a picture. Just describe the picture for us. Yeah, the opening of the book is a very famous photo. It's a satellite image of Northeast Asia taken by night. And you see these brilliant sparkling lights in South Korea. And you see, you know, lights in Japan, even lights in north northeastern China, which is, you know, largely quite remote. And then North Korea is almost completely black. There's a tiny little splotch at Pyongyang. Um and it, it's so crisply delineated as this, you know, black hole in the midst of Asia. And, you know, I thought that that, you know, was a great image to show how our, our awareness about North Korea, you know, we thought of this as a black hole and we didn't think about the people as, as real people with who, you know, laughed and loved and, 
you know, were sad and also happy. Um, and, you know, that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to bring to life these people. And, you know, and also I'd say, as, as you mentioned, North Koreans were greatly demonized um, in the Western media, you know, kind of made fun of as these... Um, you know, these robotic, um, you know, robotic creatures without, um, you know, any sort of heart and soul. It was all also, you know, kind of racist, anti-Asian stuff in the imagery. And, you know, I wanted, I wanted to bring them to life. And, and in so many ways, you, you do, Mainly because you take them seriously, you take their lives seriously, and 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 I want to move on to the lives that you do in, engage with, with with such compassion and humanity, and and yet there is this element of how you write where you're not you're not in it. In fact, one of the judges, um, the chair of the judges that I spoke to in the last podcast, talked about how unassuming your presence was in in the books i want to talk about that too but but let's go on to the stories because you've you've chosen to to focus on you mentioned you wanted to see these people you know and and in all their glory you know whether they were sad or happy or whether they fell in love and 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 love is the thing that opens opens the book tell us about uh, miran and and jun sang uh yes the, these are the opening people on the book and Miran um, was a kindergarten teacher in North Korea, and I had gone to interview her for you know very typical journalistic story. It was about starving children, and we had this you know long interview about what it was like to teach in a kindergarten when the the students were starving, and you you know she watched them one by one drop out of school, and then she'd find out that they died. But I asked her, you know, what what might we might call we sort of got into girl talk, and I said like, well, like, what did you do for fun in North Korea? You know, what are your happiest moments? Hey, did you have a boyfriend? And this led to the story that really is the the um, scaffolding of the book. Um, yes, she had a boyfriend. Um, they. The boyfriend, so to speak. I mean, she said it took you know took them three years to hold hands and another six to kiss, and then nothing went any further than that because this is this is North Korea, no sex, please. Um, it's extraordinarily but she, society. You know, it really is so interesting. It, it, yeah, but it's um, she, you know she she talked about walking with this this boy in the dark because there was no light in North Korea then, you know, eventually holding hands and how how magical that experience was. And it was the happiest memory of her life. Um, you know, it was all, already after everybody was short of food, but she was so happy at that moment. And that that question, which I think started with Miran, became the question I asked every North Korean I met, you know, what's your happiest moment? And you know that that brought out the full human, full range of human experience, not just the you know the horror, um, you know. And I, I I've, I've quoted in my my book sometimes Primo Levi who once said you know in the concentration camps that there was there's never rarely like complete misery because you always have hope and there's never complete happiness, but that there was never complete misery. You know, there there were things about North Korea and their lives that were wonderful too. And I think that was um, sort of the underlying theme of the book, you know, who they are. I mean, it, interspersed in the stories that they tell you and their their longings, their yearnings and so on, that there, there, there is the grimness of life in, in North Korea, which you which you also intersperse again with 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 kind of mini history lessons, if you like, although they don't come across like that at all. They're, they're completely relevant to the lives of, of, of the people. And, and you get a real sense of how important history is to North Koreans, but also the way in which it creates um, 
the social strata in in society. Just explain a little bit about that because it clearly makes an impact that Miran's father is who he was and and her boyfriend's family are who they are. Yes, I mean, everybody in North Korea was ranked via this sort of neo-Confucian slash feudal um, hierarchy where your your position in society was based on your loyalty to the leadership, whether you were, you know, part of the core class of communists, whether you were part of the hostile class, in which case you might be um, in a gulag, or, you know, the large um, wavering class. And Miran's family was sort of at the bottom end of the wavering class. Her her father had been a um, in the Korean War on the other side. He was a South Korean who was captured and eventually integrated into North Korean life. So that gave her what what was called tainted blood, and it made it very um, difficult for her to date or to get a better job. Um, and that all came out of, yeah, it all came out of, you know, many years of history going back to the time of the emperors, to feudal society, and this this version of, the strange version of communism that was introduced by Kim Il-sung, which, you know, took, you know, borrowed elements from Christianity, um, elements from the imperial times, and I, I did, it's true, I did put a lot of history in there about the North Korean regime and, the, and how North Korea developed out of this divided peninsula. Um, but I, I tried to do it through the eyes of these people and their experiences to to humanize it. And I mean, I think that's part of, you know, writing narrative nonfiction um, I mean, I don't want to say to, you know, making it palatable because that sounds like putting, you know, medicine in a <laughs> spoonful of sugar. Or well, making but, sure we um, all eat our broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it doesn't, it doesn't yes, come indeed, across yeah, like that know. at all. It really doesn't. I mean, I think you do exactly what you're saying. Um, you know, you do integrate it into the lives because the history it makes an impact on these people's lives. I, I I want to move on to Dr. Kim because you mentioned you mentioned the um the the children that uh, Miran looked after in the kindergarten. I mean the, the 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 pain that is depicted in the the doctor's inability to help the children that she looks after because she just can't. She doesn't have the 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 tools, the medicines to help is just so powerful. Well, the the you know in the in her case, the tools were not um, you know particularly high tech. Um, you know the tools were food. Um, you know children would come into the hospital because they were starving or their digestive systems were obstructed because they um, ate you know corn cobs or corn husks rather than the actual corn. This is what people did to expand their their food supply and it was it was heartbreaking and i think what what you know i i tried to show in these sections is you know i wanted pe- people to empathize is like how would you how would you react if you were in this situation um at one point dr kim talks to um uh runs into an old friend who says that I think her husband and her child have died of starvation. And this friend says, well, it's better, fewer mouths to feed. And Dr. Kim is, is, you know, obviously horrified, but she realizes this is what they've become in times of hardship. And, you know, you know, I've thought about these dystopian novels like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, you know, what happens to people in times of hardship, but this is, you know, this is real. And I was very interested in, you know, the the psychology of these people and thinking like, you know, what would I do? What would I do? And I think we all, I think when we read good books, you know, books about the Holocaust or war, we think like, how would I cope? Would I be one of the 
good Germans or a righteous Gentile? Um, you know, would I be a survivor? Um, so, so I thought her story and what she shared with me um, was, um, you know, touched me very deeply. And, and and in fact, it's not it's not just that she can't help the children that she that are in her are placed in her care because she can't feed them, but she she can't feed herself. No, and there's a there's a I mean I don't want to get away with it, but there's a scene when she gets gets to China and she has this epiphany. I mean they all have an epiphany at some point where she sees um, rice being put out, white rice with scraps of meat being put out. Um, in a courtyard, and she realizes that that's for the dog, and that dogs in China eat better than doctors in North Korea, and that that is a, a you know major turning point for her. And every person in that book has that kind of that that moment where they realize. Is, is there a sense in your mind when you look at the how much North Korea has been in the headlines? more recently, especially around the kind of hoopla caused when Donald Trump was in the was in the White House and, and the summit uh, with with North Korea when he was president. I mean, do you feel that that things have shifted in people's perceptions of what they think North Korea is? Or, or does it still feel to you like it is this kind of country to be demonized because it has the possibility of, of nuclear weapons and so on? I mean, it's interesting. I've been thinking about the climate around North Korea, you know, how it's changed since 2010 when that book came out in the UK. Um, and, you know, at the time, North Korea was very much news of the weird. It was, you know, this outlier, most repressive country in the world. And there was still a belief that it was, you know, going to collapse soon. You know, this sort of inevitability of, democracy and all of that. And, you know, really in the ensuing 13 years, frankly, the rest of the world has become more like North Korea. Um, it's not as weird. And I'm thinking specifically about China, um, because the North Koreans were always, um, you know, they were always excited when their leader would go to China, there'd be a visit by the Chinese leader, we'll open up like China, you know, we'll open up like China. But Actually, China is going the opposite way, you know, and you see this in so many parts of the world. You, you mean in terms of it being more authoritarian and more controlling? that the rest of the world has become more like North Korea yeah. rather than North Korea becoming more like the rest of the world? I don't think things in North Korea are better. Um, there are a lot of reports right now of, um, you know, famine again, not not just food insufficiency, but but actual famine, um, in part because of the COVID lockdowns. I mean, it had gotten better for some years. And of course, the relationship between North Korea and China means that it, it, it is a country that is completely dependent on China, both for fuel and food. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And they slammed shut their borders in 2020. And they were, um, you know, rightfully concerned about COVID coming in from from China, but it was also a way of establishing control. I mean, I wonder. I, I, let, let's move on to the, the the way in which the book changed things for you, because you you won you won the award and. What what happened? I mean, in what way did that change things for you as a as a journalist, as a writer? I think it. I think um, the biggest thing it gave me was more confidence. Um, I, I I guess like like many of us, I've always been you know fairly fairly insecure <laughs> as a writer and a journalist. It, it took me a very long time to get my career going. I was. Making an occupational hazard, being insecure, for, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was making $185 a week for a very long time. Um, the, um, you know, maybe it's just personality. Um, it was kind of difficult to get this book published. My my first agent 
sat on the proposal for a year and a half and people were telling me that North Korea is a loser topic. And it, it was just, it was great. It was just a great boost that would, you know, let me keep going and keep going, doing the kind of work I like to do, which was to, you know, really get inside um, people's heads, you know, and get away from, you know, some of the journalistic cliches and the, you know, the, this kind of like drop in journalism, you know, you, you find somebody, interview them in an hour, never see them again. You know, what is, there's a book titled, you know, anybody, any, anybody here been raped and speak English, Yeah. you know, and that was, that was kind of what we did, you know, yeah. it was sort of exploitative. I, and I really, I mean, it's not, we do great work and journalists do great work, but I, re I really wanted to get beyond and, you know, I, I wanted to, um, to, you know, to help people understand. I mean, I think my, my writing is different from other book writers and that I write very simple. You know, I want things to be, you know, very clear and I want the books to be readable by people who, you know, are not experts in the region. And in in the case of Nothing to Envy, the book, um, you know, was really designed for people who might not be able to find Korea on a map. I mean, they had to be people who, you know, read books and were interested in the world. But um, Korea was, you know, not on anybody's radar. I mean, you know, we in the U.S., learned a lot about Vietnam. We learned a lot about World War II. But the Korean War and, and all of Korea was a mystery. I mean, some people you know, were into K-pop or Taekwondo. Um, so I wanted to open up this this culture, this country, for for you know readers who didn't know. So well, you, you know, it, it was a vindication. You, yeah, I, I, I wonder where that first agent is now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, you you certainly did that, but I also feel like you're underselling the the writing by just saying that you write simply because that you know there is um there is immense beauty in how you how you tell these stories and and I and I it it's so clear from a reader's perspective that you not only respect these people but you but you like them and I I want to just ask you about you talked about obsession right at the beginning and I and I I wonder to what extent these people changed you meeting them and learning about their lives and gaining their trust so that they told you their stories did that change you oh there's so much that changed me and you know I remained very close to all of these people uh through the end of 2019, right before COVID, I saw a lot of them in Seoul. I used to go to Korea every every year, and the people I saw were the North Koreans. Um, I mean, this is kind of you know kind of cliched in a way, but the the you know the appreciation for simple pleasures that you get, you know, talking to somebody who can describe, you know, their first experience eating an apple, hmm. you know, or a banana, um, you know, really brings back your, your love of life. And, you know, some of their, some of their wisdom about their families, um, you know, this, I mean, this is another cliche, but we're all so much the same. I mean, what do we care about, you know, our kids, our kids' education, taking care of elderly parents, that's my generation, um, you know, very, very much, very much the same people. So the, the life lessons were not so different from anybody else I interviewed. And, and now that you, I mean, you said that the book winning, winning the prize um, in the first instance gave you confidence as a, as a writer. How does it feel now to be one of the six shortlisted books on the winner of winners it, it, it's you know it, it's hard to say I, i'm i'm just um you know i'm happy that the book continues to attract readers and you know that it that it you know brings people into looking at very very foreign cultures 
and there's so many so many parts of the world that you know are really hard for us to appreciate really hard to get appreciate the people and I'm, when I'm saying we I'm talking about Americans who I think are are quite isolate isolationist in their mentality um, so yeah I'm I what can I say I'm, I'm pleased are you willing to tell us what you're working on on now what we might be able to enjoy from you next sure you know well I did um, I published in 2020 really a very similar book about Tibetans and it's about life in a small Tibetan town um, and very much the same trying to get beyond the cliches about Tibetans and I'm I'm finishing now another China based book which is about um, adopted Chinese girls but and their families and when I say their families I mean their birth families and it really is um, a vehicle to look at life in the Chinese countryside in the 80s and 90s when families um, were forced to give up their daughters um, so again I'm trying to get you know inside these people's lives and I think you know I think that um, sort of that goal informs um, all the work I do. Well, we look forward to it, Barbara. Thank you so much for joining us from New York and uh, the very best of luck uh, with being on the shortlisted uh, list. How do I describe it? Yes, being on the shortlist. Um, thanks very much for, for being with us. We'd also like to thank the Blavatnik Family Foundation for its generous support of this podcast. To find out more about the Bailey Gifford Prize, you can visit the website or follow us on Twitter, if that's what you do, at BG Prize. And if this episode has piqued your interest in the history of the prize, then you can find a 30-minute documentary on our website. The Winner of Winners Award will be announced on the 27th of April at an event held at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. In the meantime, do join me again to hear me talk uh, to the other shortlisted authors about what impact winning the Bailey Gifford Prize has had on their lives and a little more about their books, of course. Till the next time. Bye-bye. Read Smart, the Bailey Gifford Prize for Nonfiction podcast. This podcast is generously supported by the Blavatnik Family Foundation.